Hello, good evening. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited that you're all here. Uh, thank you for being here, for joining us to celebrate 10 years at the International Migration Research Center and all of the collaborative work uh, that goes on. My name is Allison Mounts. I have the pleasure of directing the center, and I am a geographer on faculty at Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, I'd like to say we're so delighted that you're all here from the Laurier community, from the Balsillie School, from the Kitchener-Waterloo community, and also thanks to our, our many guests who will be speaking tonight. Um, I want to acknowledge that we're gathered tonight on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. There are long histories of migration and displacement in this region. And it's important for us to remember and understand those and to connect them when we discuss contemporary migrations and displacements tonight. It's hard to imagine a more urgent and pressing and important topic of conversation than global migration. So globally, numbers of people displaced have reached historic highs since the aftermath of World War II when the global community came together to design the current architecture that governs migration. And of course, this is the issue, the topic to which many of us here tonight devote our work. We're so lucky that we get to do this work here in Waterloo Region, which historically um, has been and remains today an important uh, community that welcomes newcomers. Tonight, we're here to celebrate 10 years, and we have a fun evening planned. Um, I want to say just a couple of quick things before we proceed with the rest of the program. First, I want to remind you all of how important the work is that you do. Uh, and by that, I mean the work of research that happens here, uh, but also all of the work involved in immigration itself. So what it is to move, to settle, to join a new community, to start a new life, and also what it is to welcome and advocate and support and to work together as a community. Um, this work is important here locally, as I said, in the region, but also in Canada and globally. Uh, immigration, of course, touches every part of our lives, our shared economic, cultural, and political lives. Yesterday, I actually was in Ottawa. I had the opportunity to be part of a program called Science Meets Parliament, and um, it was hosted by Canada's chief science advisor. And the idea of the program was to bring researchers into conversation and contact with members of parliament to generate interest in research. Um, and I wanted to share a couple of observations from that experience and those conversations. First, everyone is thinking and talking about immigration. Second, parliamentarians really need our help. So everyone I met with, every single MP said, can you help me, please? Um, they need help explaining immigration to the Canadian public. They need help in designing effective immigration and refugee policies. And they need help in the provision of empirical evidence, good information um, to support good policy making. So again, this is to underscore how important the work is of research now and into the future, because they have their work cut out for them and we have our work cut out for us. The last thing I wanted to say is that it was so easy and so fun to talk about the work uh, that my colleagues and our students uh, do here in collaboration with community members. Uh, we're really proud of this work and um, it's, very, it's very fun and, and um, important to share it. And that's the most pleasure I actually derive um, working here with the International Migration Research Center is that coming together in collaboration and sharing uh, what we do. So on that note, um, I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague, Dr. Kim Rigel, who's on the faculty in political science at Laurier and who is the associate director of the IMRC. Thanks, Alison. Um, I think I speak not just for myself, but for many of us um, who are here when I say that one of the things that those of us who are affiliated with the IMRC really value is our collaborative relationships and the importance we place in building community, building community with one another, but also building community with everybody in the Waterloo region and with our community partners in the Waterloo region. And in this, we have doctors Margaret Walton Roberts and Jenna Hennebury to thank for their leadership 
in building a center with such a strong, uh, strong networks between faculty, between faculty and students, government, and community partners. And Allison and I truly value the sense of community that we feel is really at the heart of the IMRC. The IMRC seeks to create a platform for debate, research, policy analysis, community engagement, and proposal development related to international migration and mobility at global, national, regional, and local scales. We work both within the community, but then also globally. And if you've had a chance to see outside in the foyer, um, the around the world map, you'll really see just how extensive and global the IMRC faculty and student network is. Of course, the research we do and the events we hold and the talks we host, they would not be possible without our friends, colleagues, and collaborators. And we'd like to acknowledge and thank all of you and to many of the community partners who are out here today as well. We'd like to thank you for the work you do every day in our community. We're very happy that so many of, us, uh, of you could join us today. And we'd like to acknowledge and give a special thanks to the many people who have shown such support for, and belief in the IMRC, including the Faculty of Arts and Dean Richard Nemesvari, the Office of Research Services, and we're particularly grateful to the Vice President of Research and Acting Provost, Dr. Rob Gordon, for his very strong support of the IMRC, and to Laurie's President, Dr. Deborah McClatchy. We work with really such wonderful colleagues at Ball Silly School. We feel very um, blessed about that, and we would like to acknowledge the support of the school's director, Dr. John Ravenhill, the Migration, Mobilities, and Social Politics Research Cluster, which has helped to support uh, tonight's lecture, and Dr. Suzanne Iljan, thanks for being here. Um, and we'd like to thank also the many people who really uh, you know, make the school run, Kelly Brown, and uh, Joanne Weston and Tiffany Bradley, who have done such a wonderful job and, and do such a wonderful job daily on the administrative and event management of the school. And we've been extremely fortunate to have a new colleague now working with the IMRC, um, although he's actually worked extensively with many of us before through research services. Dr. Sean Lockwood has joined the IMRC as the Research and Centre Coordinator. And I don't know if he's here or not. He may be outside, <laughs> unfortunately. So I wanted to say to Sean that we are so appreciative of all of his indispensable support. And this day and event absolutely would not have been possible if it were not for Sean. So Sean, if you, he cannot hear, but we'll pass the word to thank him very much. And we'd like to acknowledge um, the help of CG's technicians in IT and AV and the knowledge mobilization team at Laurier, Shauna Riebling, and CPAM. And finally, we would not be the center we were if uh, it were not for the fabulous students with whom we have the opportunity to engage and we engage um, every day. And really, the students, it's your ideas and your research that stimulate us and that give us the hope, the work that we do, and your tireless energy is so appreciated. So really thank you, and so many of you are here who have worked on making today's celebrations possible. So really thank you very much to all of you. Thanks, Kim. So the president of Wilfrid Laurier University, Dr. Deb McClatchy, unfortunately couldn't join us this evening because she's out of town, but she wanted to share in the celebration and prepared a very short video to share with us. So if you wouldn't mind, please cueing the video. Good evening, everyone. I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight celebrating the 10-year anniversary of the International Migration Research Center. However, I wanted to share with you how pleased I am to continuously hear about the excellent work accomplished in this thriving center. Right now, the world is facing the highest levels of displacement on record. Over 65 million people have been forced to leave their homes. In this time, when migration and refugee issues are of critical global concern, our faculty and students are engaging in research that provides understanding and offers research-based solutions. In collaboration with the Balsili School of International Affairs, the IMRC's work helps to inform public policy and assist NGOs and governments in understanding and managing international migration. Over the last decade, the IMRC has established a global set of networks and relationships that help bring both global and local perspectives to this work. The depth and breadth of this research is unparalleled in our region. The IMRC exemplifies Laurier's strong reputation for interdisciplinary research. Our researchers collaborate across the faculties of science, human and social sciences, arts, and liberal arts. I am so pleased to see the legacy built by the IMRC over the last decade. This center is a shining example of the importance Laurier places on building collaborative partnerships within the community. I look forward to seeing what the next many years will bring. 
Again, congratulations on this milestone, and I hope that you enjoy the evening. Thank you, President McClatchy, and to her office. Uh, our next speaker uh, was mentioned earlier, and that is Dr. John Ravenhill, who is our director here at the Balsillie School of International Affairs. John. Well, thank you, Alison. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for this very special occasion. One of the things that has given me the greatest pleasure during my term as director of the BSIA has been to work with the IMRC. For me, the center is the epitome of what the school should be about. And I'll make six points on why I believe this to be so. They will be brief though, don't worry. <laughs> A couple of them you've already heard from uh, Laurier's president, uh, Deb McClatchy. First off, the center is multidisciplinary. Second, its work applies rigorous, theoretically informed academic research to some of the most pressing problems currently facing humankind. Third, this research has had an influence on the policies of governments and international organizations both because of its quality and because of the very effective links that the center and its researchers have established with these institutions. Fourth, the center and those working within it have been very successful in winning competitive external funding for their work. Fifth, even though the center belongs to Laurier, its leadership has always encouraged colleagues, and that is faculty and students alike, colleagues from UW to participate in its work. And indeed, one of its board members is a UW faculty member. This is the sort of cross-institutional collaboration that the school was established to promote. Six, the center does more than any other grouping in the school to provide students an opportunity for involvement in its work, both as paid research assistants and as participants in its projects. And so it was no surprise to me that Kim mentioned, gave prominent mention to students in her remarks. It's also been a pioneer in bringing international students to the school under the MITAX Global Links program. Now, anyone who's been involved in establishing a center, especially a multidisciplinary center, establishing and sustaining a center at a university, knows how much hard work and often personal sacrifice that goes into this endeavor. It's a fantastic achievement to bring the IRC to where it is today in 10 years. And I'm delighted that Laurier is now recognizing the center for the jewel that it is. Warm congratulations to the founding directors, to Jenna and Margaret for all their work in the early years. And it's maybe perhaps a little difficult now to remember that they were both relatively junior faculty when the center was launched. Congratulations to them. Congratulations to Alison and Kim for what they are doing in further strengthening the center. But a seventh and final point about it. Alison, Jenna, Kim, and Margaret are all wonderful colleagues. For me, it has been not just intellectually stimulating, but a real joy to work with them. Thank you so much for giving me that opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, John, for the kind and warm words. We're so fortunate um, to be housed here in the Balsillie School of International Affairs and to get to work with you and the staff here and our colleagues. 
Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, and this is Catherine Fife, who's here, our MPP from Waterloo. Welcome. Good evening. I think that John just did his best John Cleese uh, impersonation. I don't know, you reminded me so much of uh, that actor. Um, in a good way. In a good way, yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure to spend some time uh, with all of you this evening. Um, I am RC's contributions to the political discourse on refugees, on immigrants, and migrant workers has been invaluable at all levels of government. Uh, your research provides an evidence base to influence policy change, particularly uh, labor laws, protection of non-citizen and migrant workers. And I must tell you, around three years ago, I participated uh, at the invitation of Jenna and of Janet McLaughlin on a panel. And uh, at the time, uh, one, of the, um, one of my co-panelists you know, asked the question of the audience. He said, if you were an individual and you came to another country and someone uh, took your passport and tethered you to an employer, and you were not covered by the Employment Standards Act of Ontario, what would you call that? And the audience described that as modern day slavery. And as a parliamentarian, it was a moment uh, where I realized that I did not fully understand the full employment uh, reality in the province of Ontario. And I've, I've shared that story many times um, at committee, uh, in the legislature and with my own caucus members. And so I sincerely want to thank IMRC for that education. And that education actually is ongoing. And it is, to, to say it to, you know, in a gentle way, the education of parliamentarians needs to happen on an hourly, on a daily, on a monthly basis, especially during these times. Uh, events like this remind us of the importance of the work being done in the sector and the ongoing work and advocacy required. And I am sincerely grateful to have you and, this, uh, and the work that you do in our community for the past 10 years. I look forward to the continued collaboration and conversation. And as uh, workplace rights for Ontarians gets rolled back by the current provincial government, I think that we will be defining a new relationship uh, for all workers in the province and indeed in the country. Thank you very much. And now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker, another MPP from Kitchener Centre, uh, Laura May Lindo. Thank you. So I just want to start by saying happy birthday. Ten years, that's amazing. Um, I don't know if people know, but my critic portfolios are citizenship and immigration, as well as anti-racism. Um, as the citizenship and immigration critic, I want to say thank you. Um, thank you for all of the work that you've done, but also thank you for all of the work that I know you still have to do. Um, as a new person on the scene, on the political scene, um, and coming from the, the academic world, this is definitely the time that we need your help as academics to be able to do the work that we need to do in Parliament. Um, I'd also like to say that I do not think that the um, bringing together of citizenship and immigration and anti-racism portfolios was an accident. Um, when we think about new immigrants and somebody fleeing their country, for instance, um, and arriving here, one of the things that we often don't want to talk about is the racism that they experience. And so um, I'm excited and look forward to building a relationship um, with all of you or maintaining a relationship because I kind of feel like I'm coming home. For those that don't know, I was the Director of Diversity and Equity at Laurier right before I became the MPP in Kitchener Centre. And so um, I'm, I look forward to building a new type of relationship, one where I can take the knowledge and the wisdom that's imparted here 
um, and bring that to Queen's Park so that we can have real conversations about the impact of some of the policies and practices and some of the basic uses of language that seem to um, have been normalized at Queen's Park that I can't fight against that alone. So thank you. And no matter what happens uh, from the political scene outside of this amazing uh, uh, work that you're doing, please don't stop. That's my request to you. Because the minute you stop is the minute that I will not be able to do the job that I have to do as the uh, critic for a ministry that no longer exists, um, and anti-racism, which we know far too well does. Thank you so much. OK, thank you. Our next speaker is Tara Bedard. She is the executive director of immigration part the Immigration Partnership, and she's also a community board member of our IMRC board. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, good evening everyone. Allison, thank you for the welcome. As Allison said, my name is Tara. I'm the executive director with the Waterloo Region Immigration Partnership. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the Immigration Partnership in Waterloo Region, although I know many of you do because I saw many partners here tonight, the Immigration Partnership is a collaborative planning place where settlement organizations and other community service organizations in Waterloo Region, our business community, our municipalities, and community members in Waterloo Region come together because they have an interest in developing the capacity of this community to better support immigrants and refugees. And it was also 10 years ago when the, internet, when the immigration partnership for this region was starting. And over the 10 years that the IMRC has existed and the immigration partnership has existed, um, there has been a lot of efforts to try to keep the connections and grow the relationship between these two entities which have been growing um, in this community at the same time focusing on many, many of the same issues, um, whether those be on an international platform out in the world or here in Waterloo Region and how what happens out in the world has an impact here for individuals in this community. Um, I've been with the partnership for the last four years and I know that the collaboration between the people involved in the IMRC and those involved in the immigration partnership um, existed long before I came on the scene. And so the focus of this center really in being a part of the community that it is rooted in and supporting the organizations that are working in this community to support some immigrants and refugees has really had an impact um, in the capacity of this community, of organizations in this community, and of our partnership efforts um, to really improve how immigrants and refugees are supported in this community. And um, I think it's a testament um, that the center has dedicated a space on its board for somebody from the community to help keep rooted kind of the big, big space around immigration and on the world platform um, and what that means in this community. And so on behalf of the Immigration Partnership from Waterloo Region and all of our community partners, I would like to thank the IMRC for making that a focus of your work um, because it means a lot. And um, I think through the collaborations that we've had to date, there's been a lot of great learnings for this community and for the world. Um, and you've really helped to reinforce, you know, a lot of the things and the expertise that people in this region hold um, that are not only applicable here for how we do things better, but that can help to improve um, you know, global migration experiences. So thank you for that focus. Thank you so much, Tara. We're so fortunate to have you um, and the work that you do in this community and also to have you as part of the IMRC. We're very grateful. Um, and speaking of being grateful, I now have the pleasure of introducing my friends and colleagues, Drs. Margaret Walsh and Roberts and Jenna Hennebry. As has been mentioned, they together 10 years ago um, co-founded the Migration Research Center 
And I know for me, when I arrived here, um, once uh, at that point, eight years ago, the IMRC had already been started and it was a home. It was an intellectual home, a political home that I arrived in and was very grateful for um, from, from the very beginning for me at Laurier. So um, they are going to come, us, come up and tell us just a little bit of that history of how the IMRC came together. Thank you both. Ten years, oh, man. ten years, ten years ago, Margaret and I imagined bringing together uh, an interdisciplinary group of scholars at Laurier and beyond who have shared interests in international migration to foster meaningful research and have a positive impact on the world and on the lives of people on the move. We envisioned a hub of research and energetic change we hoped that people would come together um, to share knowledge, to act, to influence how society and governments think about, plan for, and engage with migration. Our vision was rooted in a deep commitment to and a respect for migrant rights, diversity, and inclusion, which seem more vital with each passing day and news feed these days. At the same time though, 10 years ago, it seemed both idealistic and ideal to have such a center, but with the support of Laurier and later the Balsillie School, it seems we weren't just blue sky thinking. We managed to do it. So thank you all for being here with us to celebrate it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So okay. So. Um, thank you, but it didn't happen overnight. We began by planning collaborative research and events. We did relatively mundane things, such as creating structures to foster participation in the centre and applying for grants to support the centre's endeavours. We developed the Policy Points series, uh, which you can access on our website, to highlight policy-relevant research. We collaborated with the Canadian Im Immigration Historical Society to establish a $1,000 annual student award for essay competition. We organized workshops, conferences, and speaker events to highlight research being done at Laurier on international migration. So somewhere along the way though, uh, while, all, while we were busy planning, uh, working, supervising students, hosting events, um, suddenly we're at 10 years, and our center now has a network of over 3,000 people worldwide. We have a MOU with the biggest uh, uh, university in Mexico. Uh, we've influenced policy, mentored dozens of students, and we have consultative status with the United Nations. So most importantly though, throughout this last decade for us has been building a community. And uh, I think you've seen that and heard that already tonight. And hopefully you'll feel it uh, throughout the evening uh, tonight. Uh, we feel that the center is here because of this community and because of all of these connections. And indeed, it is these very connections. We wouldn't be here without the efforts and passion of the many researchers, staff, students, colleagues, friends, and again, Thanks for being here today. You don't have to talk again. So, but we are, at, we are really excited now to have Alison Mounts and Kim Rigel, who stepped in to be the center's new directors. It could only be the Jenna and Margaret show for so long. They are two exceptional researchers and schol collaborative scholars who continue to imagine and realize the center and what it can be with us in the coming years. This is a sign of our organic, collaborative and creative growth and the center could not be in better hands. There's not time enough to thank everyone individually, so thank please forgive us for being incomplete. We'd like to thank the new directors again, all of the engaged IMRC board members and associates who we've worked with over the last decade, current and former students, fellows and assistants who've been the backbone of every event, every grant, every initiative. Their success is in fact one of the most important measures of the success of the IMRC. We are so proud of the many students who have worked with us at the IMRC and who have gone on to have successful careers in government, academia, and the public and private sector. And please excuse us for one minute while we ask for any of those students in the audience who have worked with us over the last 10 years, if you would just stand up quickly so we could see you and say hi. 
Any students? Anybody connected to us? Let's see where you are. So Please we had. Up, thank you. Thank you. There's more. There's more. Of them, yeah. We know there are more because some of them came today and we had a lovely lunch with many of our students. Uh, we also want to thank the faculty um, here at the Balsili School. Thank you, John, so much for that wonderful um, speech that you made. The various departments that have already been thanked by Alison and Kim, they've given us so many opportunities. Our community partners have been amazing. Uh, the Local Immigration Partnership, the Occupational Health Clinics uh, for Ontario workers, local officials in Kitchener-Waterloo, um, partners at the provincial and federal level that have supported our research and our students in numerous ways. And we would like to finally thank all of the friends and family of the IMRC team for putting up for all of the work and all of the meetings. So thank you very much again, and we're really excited uh, to see what we ma imagine together in the next 10 years, and we look forward to working with you and uh, creating together and imagining together. In closing, one of our most special events at the IMRC is our signature lecture series that's named in honor of my dear friend and exceptional scholar, the late Dr. Carrie Privish. I'm really pleased to introduce to you tonight uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Janet McLaughlin, who not only co-founded this series with me, but has been an absolutely vibrant light on the IMRC board and engaged in IMRC events uh, since the outset. Um, and so I'm gonna ask uh, Janet to come up and introduce uh, our speaker for tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> And cue the pictures, please. <laughs> Carrie Pribish was a dear friend and colleague of mine and, and many of us in this room. For those of you who didn't know her, she was a much loved professor at the University of Guelph and she was a generous mentor to many students, colleagues and activists. Through her impressive career, Carrie became an internationally recognized scholar for her work in rural sociology, globalized agricultural and food systems, and the people who labor in those systems, particularly migrant farm workers. Carrie worked especially closely with migrant women from Mexico and Guatemala. Based on years of dedicated research, she was among the first scholars to write about the unique issues facing women migrant workers in a field normally dominated by the male perspective. She also helped us to understand the social relations between Canadians and migrant workers and migrant centrality to Canadian and global food systems. Carrie's findings not only made their way into international and national journals, she also returned her research directly to migrant workers engaging them and their communities in helping to create positive change. The workers deeply cared for and appreciated the woman whom they affectionately called La Professora Carey. Carey gave expert testimony at human rights tribunal proceedings in front of various provincial, national, and international bodies, tirelessly advocating for better treatment and policies for the migrant workers she loved. She was recognized with the Cesar Chavez Black Eagle Award in Agricultural Workers' Rights for these efforts. In January of 2016, Carrie passed away after courageously facing a two-year journey with cancer. To honor her memory and to recognize the importance of her academic work and to extend its reach, Jenna and I initiated the Carrie Pribish Lecture Series that same year. Although Carrie's absence has been deeply felt among her academic colleagues, the greatest loss was experienced by her family and most acutely by her two dear young children, Sophia and Benjamin. It is our hope that by videotaping this lecture series each year, when her children grow into adults, they will have the opportunity to continue hearing from the many people whose lives their mother's work touched and inspired. 
So far, we have been deeply fortunate to have all three of the Carey Pribish lecturers as those whose work directly intersected with Carey's and also those who knew and worked with her while she was alive. This year is no exception and it is our true honor to invite a scholar whose work Carrie deeply admired to deliver this year's lecture in her name. Faye Faraday is a nationally recognized social justice lawyer, strategic advisor, and policy consultant, and founder of Faraday Law. Her work focuses on labor, human rights, and constitutional law, and collaborative strategy and organizing with community organizations and coalitions in support of decent work. Faye has worked with and advocated for the rights of transnational migrant workers since 1990. As a Metcalf Foundation Innovation Fellow, Faye has written three landmark reports on migrant worker rights, which I always make my students read. Faye is also an assistant professor at Osgoode Hall Law School and the former Packing Visiting Chair in Social Justice at York University. Her work has been deeply influential to all of us who are scholars in the area of migrant rights, and her reach has extended far beyond the academic world to her many engagements in public scholarship, legal cases, and media interviews. It is a true pleasure to welcome Faye Faraday to deliver this year's Carrie Pribish Memorial Lecture. Thank you so much, um, Janet, for that introduction. And I really want to thank uh, Jenna and Janet for inviting me here to, to give the lecture tonight. Um, as soon as I got the email from them, I think I responded within about 30 seconds saying, yes, absolutely, I will be there. Um, and uh, I want to start off uh, today, um, actually, um, am I doing this correctly? Okay, there we go, whoops. I want to start off today um, telling a, a story about Carrie because um, I did admire her work um, enormously. She was a brilliant scholar um, and I still, I use her work um, regularly in the courses I teach, in um, the work that I do. Uh, but beyond being a brilliant scholar, Carrie was an incredibly warm uh, person, a very friendly person, and uh, we got on so well. She is someone who I counted as a friend. And um, we got to know each other because uh, we were doing research, um, both of us were doing research with migrant farm workers, um, she was uh, an expert witness in litigation that uh, I was uh, that I was involved in, um, and she agreed to write uh, a chapter in a book that I edited. And while we were working on that chapter, we had a lot of discussions um, about how uh, what we were doing, what the project was about. And I think one of the things that was so important about the work that Carrie did is that she. Um, put migrant workers' voices and their faces front and center. Um, she didn't let us turn away from the human cost of the systems that we created. And one of the things that we ended up talking about a lot was um, an advertisement that Carrie had come across in um, a, an agricultural magazine. And we wanted to include it in our book, but uh, we didn't have copyright and we were worried about getting sued. Um, but we described it in detail instead. And I'd like to read some of this to you from, from Carrie's chapter, um, because I think that it gives a real sense of um, her compassion and her um, constant recognition of the way in which the systems we create dehumanize people. And, um, you know, uh, Linda May, when you're talking about the language that is being used, it comes through that dehumanization. So here's how uh, Carrie described the ad. 
With the headline, Hire Me, in bold lettering, the image depicts sombrero-clad Hispanic men hand-hoeing a patch of particularly dry-looking earth. All of the men have their heads bent towards the ground and away from the viewer's gaze, emphasizing their submission to the manual labor in which they're engaged. One younger-looking man is without shoes or a shirt, exposing a muscled chest and arms, thus indicating both strengths and presumable willingness to labor in hot conditions. The caption reads, quote, workers from Honduras, 100% motivated to do what is needed, focused on quality and experience and hard work, end quote. The advertisement includes a toll-free number and a web address where farmers can report problems with workers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It pledges to cover the costs of replacing a worker who defaults on his contract with funds through the country's budget, uh, while promising that workers will be subject to, quote, constant monitoring of performance. Um, the website further extols the Honduran government's recruitment and pre-migration procedures. Quote, although we don't expect problems with our carefully selected workers um, that have been briefed on their obligations and conduct with their bosses, the government of Honduras has implemented this page to help in case of grievances against Honduras workers. And the imagery and the text of that advertisement powerfully reflect on how sending states um, compete for uh, a share of work placements in Canada um, and how they appeal uh, to employers' uh, demands for ever more flexible, ever more compliant workers who can be replaced um, 24-7, 365 days a year if you have any problem with them. And I think, um, in honor of Carrie, I think we, we really do need to recognize her contribution in bringing forward um, migrant workers' voices into the scholarship of labor migration. Um, and in our discussion tonight, I want to take this opportunity for us to think about where we are on that journey and to continue that discussion. A lot of, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of what I'm going to say today is not going to be new for those of you who are um, uh, working here at the center, but I think that this does present an opportunity for, uh, for discussion. And so, let's start at the beginning. Um, as was said in our land acknowledgement, um, the neutral, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee people have been here uh, since the beginning. All the rest of us who are not Indigenous, who are not um, Inuit, who are not Métis, who are not uh, people of African descent who were abducted, um, and forcibly transported and enslaved and brought to this land. All the rest of us are migrants here. And so how do we understand our relationship with this land? How do we understand our obligation to each other when we are all unwanted guests? Um, so when we think about um, migration policy. It's absolutely connected with our obligations of reconciliation to um, rebuild the kind of relationship that we have with the land and with each other. Um, but the other side of this is that migrating is a completely natural human thing to do. Um, this slide shows the patterns of migration from the beginning of the human species out of Africa, out of the, um, the Fertile Valley, across the globe. And people migrate for any number of reasons and always will. Sometimes it's out of curiosity. As human beings, we want to know what's over the next hill, right? Um, we, but people migrate also uh, for food, for space. Um, because of um, environmental degradation, because of war, because of violence. Um, and people always, always will move. And so the question is, 
What is our response to that? How do we respond to that? We've grown quite numb over the last number of years um, to the plight of migration. We've become very familiar with seeing images like this. This is the um, migrant encampment in uh, Calais uh, that was subsequently burned to the ground in order to displace um, these migrants who were already displaced from their homelands because of war. Um, we've become completely um, inured to images of people in refugee camps lining up for food. We try to shock people into remembering that this is um, a tragedy that costs human lives. So this is one uh, demonstration lining up um, on uh, uh, Parliament in, uh, uh, in England all of a number of um, life jackets representing every person who has uh, died in the Mediterranean. It's coming on for winter now and um, we know that people are uh, risking their lives walking across the border into Canada because of the danger that they face in the United States, um, because they are racialized people, uh, because they are refugees, because they are seeking sanctuary. And, of course, um, we can't ignore what's happening today, right now as we speak. The caravan of people from Honduras who are walking hundreds of kilometers carrying their children north in the hope of a better life. Kilometers of them. The caravan was seven and a half kilometers long of people marching for safety. Um, and it continues. And so, how do we think about that? How do we start to put people at the center of migration and, uh, and build a different story. And how particularly we, do we do that right now when we are living in such polarized political times where um, immigration is a flashpoint in policy? Um, both uh, of our honorable politicians talked about how immigration is um, a key point of debate right now in Parliament in, uh, at Queen's Park. It is also a key point of discussion in our public discourse. And it's not a key point of discussion in a good way. Um, it is a flashpoint uh, and a rallying point of absolutely brazen racism and xenophobia and white supremacy, which is increasingly normalized. And how do we continue to remember um, our connectedness, our basic humanness in this context? And how do we continue to fight for those who are um, most at risk? So what I want to do is, um, do a little bit of context setting, um, talk a bit about history and myth busting, and I want to focus on the temporary labor migration programs that Canada has established. But then I want to put some questions to you for us to discuss afterwards about when is a person no longer a migrant? When do you stop being a migrant and when do you become Canadian? Um, I am still regularly asked, where am I from? Where are you from? No, 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 really, where are you from? I'm Filipino. Um, I get uh, regularly at professional conferences complimented on how well I speak English. Um, but I was born in Winnipeg, and English is the only language I speak, so I better speak it well. <laughs> Um, but, you know, there's no law enforcement um, body in Canada that has ever recognized me as Canadian, right? Um, we know what carding is all about. So, 
How do we put people first? That's the problem. How do, or that's the problem that we have to solve together. And it's organizations like the IMRC um, and uh, the research and authority that you bring to these issues that help us build that fight. Um, we uh, fight that fight with truth and with conversations that remind us that we're human. So here's some truth. Um, some just basic points. In our permanent immigration system, there's three broad streams of immigration, which, and I said that you know um, this, but I do want to just um, go over it briefly. There's uh, um, a pathway for economic migration, people who are considered able to contribute to Canada's economic well-being. There's family reunification, and then there's a, a category for refugees and persons in need of protection. And what's really significant is how over the last generation, the proportion of uh, the way in which our um, immigration is distributed has shifted significantly in terms of the proportion between those different categories. So if you look at the, um, the chart on the left, um, in, from, in the decade from 1980 to 1990, um, economic uh, um, migration and family reunification were about the same size in terms of their share of uh, overall immigration. And there was quite a large uh, uh, proportion of immigration that was uh, dedicated to refugees. You'll see how um, more recently, in the last decade, that's shifted quite significantly. So economic migration has become the prime uh, driver, the prime category of people who are considered acceptable to come to Canada. Family reunification has shrunk. And uh, the proportion who are refugees have shrunk even more significantly. So in this era where there is this heightened um, uh, rhetoric and venom directed at refugees, uh, the reality is that we're actually tightening the doors. We're making it harder for people to find sanctuary, to find safety. Both of my parents came uh, to Canada as, uh, um, as immigrants. They were refugees from their countries. Um, and when we look at the ways in which our country is making it increasingly difficult to become permanent, um, it's, uh, it's a troubling thing. We have, at this time, uh, you know, debates about, you know, and um, bills introduced in Parliament about whether we should actually repeal birthright citizenship. If there was no such thing as birthright citizenship when I was born, I would have been stateless. Um, and so we're having these, at this time, where we're making it more difficult for those who are at risk to find safety. We're also thinking of policies to make it even more difficult for them once they're here. But at the same time as there is that whole sphere of permanent immigration, we have um, created this whole festival of temporary labor migration programs. And I know you can't read what's on there, but I think what's valuable is you can see how many different programs there are for um, uh, temporary, lab uh, temporary migration into Canada. Um, the column on the left represents the temporary worker program. And within that program, there are um, already a number of sub-programs. So there's um, the uh, seasonal agricultural worker program, there's um, a broader stream for low-wage um, agricultural migration, there's the, the caregiver program, uh, there's a program for um, high-wage uh, earners. The little, thing, the little circle at the bottom 
is a group that's often forgotten in the story of people with temporary status, and that's international students. Um, and that is a category that has been expanding exponentially over the last decade. There are currently over half a million um, international students in Canada, um, many of them who are working in low-wage jobs, many of whom have no chance of ever receiving permanent status. And then in this big, um, column on the right are the broad range of um, temporary labour migration programs that uh, fall under what's called the International Mobility Program. So that includes uh, movement of people through international agreements. So we've just negotiated a new version of NAFTA. Um, it's those sort of agreements that uh, allow for movement. Um, it's, uh, uh, it represents people who are waiting for their applications for refugee status to be determined. Um, there's uh, uh, reciprocal exchange agreements with different countries, so youth traveling abroad. Um, and then a broad range of uh, programs that are considered uh, to be in Canada's interests. So um, a lot of them around uh, different economic uh, categories of um, intercompany transfers, so people in transnational companies moving across borders, um, visiting professors, uh, a whole range. As you can see, there's um, uh, quite a broad range of categories there. And you know, as I said, for those with temporary status, the international students actually make up the largest proportion of them. Um, the international mobility are the second largest, and the temporary foreign workers who tend to be uh, low-wage workers are um, a small slice of it. Um, but make no mistake, all of, um, there is vulnerability for uh, people with temporary status in all of those categories. As I said, international students are often doing the same minimum wage jobs as temporary foreign uh, workers under um, the low wage uh, migration programs. Um, people in the international mobility program, although that is that tends to be higher wage earners, also includes some incredibly vulnerable low wage workers. So you can't assume that based on the, um, the path into temporary migration that a person is secure or not. Um, increasingly, the international mobility stream is being used because there's less oversight. Um, over it. You don't need to get, as an employer, pre-authorization to hire um, a migrant worker. And to the extent that there's less oversight, there's also um, significantly more risk of abuse. So, just to get a sense, um, those, again, the numbers of people with uh, temporary status are uh, far outstripping permanent residents. The blue line represents um, the number of permanent economic immigrants that have been led into Canada um, over the, from 2000 to 2012, and those patterns have continued. Um, but what's interesting is that there's 160,000 noted here for permanent residents, and we've stayed around that number for um, uh, several decades, that only about a third of them, only about 54,000 of them, are primary applicants whose um, potential contribution to the Canadian economy is um, uh, assessed for, uh, for admission. The rest of them are um, dependents and spouses. For the other workers, with the, represented by the um, orange line and the green line, um, what you see there only is workers, only the primary applicants who are not here with their families and dependents. So when you think about the disparity between who has secure status and who doesn't, um, the uh, insecurity represented by the, uh, the orange line uh, is actually much, much higher because it's all the family and dependents who are connected with those workers who are also effectively part of this system, um, even though they can't be here. 
The, um, those rise in temporary status are replicated at the national level, at the provincial, and at the local level. So those are uh, trends that you'll see no matter um, uh, what municipality or what size of population in Canada you look at. And um, to put it all together, these are uh, statistics that were um, just released this month um, from, uh, from Immigration Canada. And last year, 70% of the people who entered Canada were temporary residents without full rights. Um, by contrast, of all the people who are immigrants in Canada, they don't make up only 1% of the population. So when we think again back to the um, uh, political rhetoric that we're hearing now about the threat of, uh, of migrants, about uh, the danger they pose to our society and our economy, let's put some reality to that. That we're creating a system that increasingly makes people um, more vulnerable, more exploitable, at a time when we're also subjecting them to increased public unapologetic hate. But this isn't new, right? We've seen this story before. We saw that with the Komagata Maru. We saw that with the SS St. Louis. And it's um, interesting, today was the day that uh, the Prime Minister issued an apology in Parliament for turning away the SS St. Louis. Um, so that people were sent back to, uh, Jewish um, refugees were sent back to Europe um, to die in the Holocaust because um, uh, they refused to grant entry to them. Um, but we continue to do this. We continue to turn people away. We continue to turn people away at the borders. Um, right? People who are irregular arrivals are uh, subject to immigration detention. We talk about, with horror, the way in which children were separated from their parents um, when uh, um, crossing the border into the US, but we do that too. We have um, children and families detained in uh, what are essentially prisons um, while they're uh, their status is challenged. Um, we have the history of the Chinese head tax, and as I said, uh, we have that history of immigration detention, that current, ongoing um, immigration detention, where people can be detained um, without a limit, right? People who've been detained for eight years, five years, with no charges against them. So, what do we do about that? I think it's important for us to think about what it is that we're doing um, in uh, constructing the policies that shape our, our migration programs. And when I talk about it, I, I like to think about um, our labor migration programs as walking along a bridge. There's a point at which you get on the bridge. There's the time that you spend going across that bridge, and then there's the side, the, the, uh, the side of the bridge where you reach the other shore. And for the entry bridge, that's the focus on who gets to get, that's you know, the uh, thresholds that we, we set as um, a society around who gets in, who's allowed to come in. And there's been a lot of focus on that, on scrutinizing that, on making um, it difficult for people to get in to, uh, um, limit the numbers, right, to have enhanced scrutiny um, over eligibility. But then people with temporary status spend all this time walking across the bridge, um, working in our society, living in our societies, and we don't really care what happens to them there, right? Um, that, is a, uh, that is where, um, as... Uh, uh, Catherine Fife was saying, um, our labor and employment laws are absolutely critical um, because if um, migrant workers, if people with temporary status don't have access to rights that protect them, 
um, then they are increasingly, um, increasingly precarious. And then coming off the bridge is who gets to stay? What are our conditions for letting people stay? And what we've done is create a system where um, those who are working class people, who are racialized working class people, don't get to stay. Um, o, A, and B represent the um, prof managerial, professional, and skilled trades. Um, and there are multiple pathways for workers in those categories to have permanent status in Canada. Um, the categories of C and D uh, reflect uh, jobs for which uh, you can have a two-year apprenticeship or jobs where you learn the skills um, on the job. And for those, uh, there is essentially no um, path to have your work recognized um, as a basis for entering the country. There is a tiny opportunity for uh, migrant caregivers to come across that path to security and permanent status. But while we've had migrant caregivers in a formal policy in Canada since the 1950s, um, that policy is closing in November of next year. Um, it is, uh, you know, the government keeps saying that, well, uh, we'll review it, we'll come up with something. But for people who are here right now, they have no idea if they will be able to stay. Um, they're being brought in, into Canada with a promise of, um, you know, let's see how it turns out, right? And if you're just waiting there, let's see how it turns out, you can imagine how vulnerable that makes you. Um, but so, let's think again about that journey on the bridge. The, um, it starts with, um, with leaving home. Um, I did, uh, one of the, the papers that Janet referred to earlier is uh, research that I did on transnational labor recruitment um, in Canada. And that's an area where there uh, is profoundly deep exploitation. It's the point in the migration cycle that creates a precariousness that poisons the whole rest of the migration cycle. And yet, there's been very little work done on it. How are people recruited to work in Canada? There's a number of different ways. Employers can hire a migrant worker directly, but that rarely happens. Um, typically, there's an intervener where an employer um, finds a recruiter to help them find uh, labor for, uh, uh, for their workplace. And that recruiter um, often has quite a network of people who are subcontracted to, uh, to find the workers to bring to Canada. Um, and there's very little accountability uh, between um, the uh, employer and the worker in that chain. The longer the chain, the more deniability there is. And we know from history, this is a picture of the Triangle sh uh, Shirtwaist Factory fire. We know from history that subcontracting chains are um, uh, a, a, a model of um, labor force organization that facilitates exploitation, right? It's called sweating. And in, you know, the garment factories, whether it's the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory or Rana Plaza or all the other garment factories that continue uh, to face a uh, life-ending disaster, um, the work is sweated out of people by um, demanding work for lower and lower wages. In the transnational migration system, it comes in the form primarily, but not exclusively, of so-called recruitment fees. And in the research that I've done, um, the amount of money that individual low-wage workers are paying in order to secure a job in Canada um, is the equivalent, roughly, to two years of their wages in their home country. So, um, at the time that I initially did this research, the, uh, you know, for Filipino workers coming to Canada, they paid the equivalent of $7,000 Canadian in order to get uh, minimum wage jobs in Canada. 
Um, it was 3,500 for workers coming from Hong Kong, 1,350 Canadian for workers coming from Guatemala. Um, but you know, for the Guatemalan workers, it was uh, six months wages to be considered for, um, uh, for labor migration. Another additional payment to, uh, to be guaranteed a job and another additional payment if you wanted to choose what kind of job you were in. Um, all of the uh, recruitment fees have been going up. So now, um, this is only uh, four years ago, uh, now instead of paying $7,000, Filipino workers are paying nine to $11,000 for those minimum wage jobs. Um, and oftentimes, the recruiters uh, are not just uh, taking that fee. Um, one of the, there's been real resistance in Canada to addressing this part of the pro uh, problem, this part of just stepping onto the bridge. Um, the, uh, uh, the response typically is, oh, that happens over there in those corrupt countries, we can't do anything about it. But the reality is that there is always a recruiter representative here in Canada who is taking the money, right? The money is collected on payday. The money is collected by people who show up at midnight and knock on the door and take workers to um, a bank, to a, um, a banking machine, and make them withdraw cash um, on payday to give to them. Um, recruiters are also often uh, connected through the employer um, to act as um, the landlord or the supervisor of the housing that is provided by an employer. So um, the uh, incentive for the recruiter in that context is to pack as many people into a house as possible and charge them as much money as possible. So what is happening is that these employer-operated housing sites become their own little profit center in addition to extracting labor for low wage. Um, so there are situations um, where, and it gets typically, um, you know, eight people in a two-bedroom uh, flat or a two-bedroom house, like that kind of overcrowding is normal. The worst situation I heard about um, was uh, a house with um, 36 workers, um, 18 of whom worked the, um, the day shift, and 18 of whom work the night shift. So that when the 18 were out at work, the other 18 were sleeping in the beds. And when one shift of workers came off, uh, they swapped places, went into the same beds, and the other workers went into work. Um, these are not isolated stories. These are things that happen on a regular basis because there is that profit, oops, that profit cent uh, incentive. Right? Whether it's money lenders, um, recruiters um, in Canada, recruiters abroad, or employers. Employers also holding passports. Um, and so the question really is, is this recruitment? Is this human trafficking? In the research that I've done, all of the workers who I met with, um, and there were, um, for this study, um, about 98 of them. All of them were fully documented workers who had come into Canada in that documented labor migration uh, program that I discussed at the beginning. So these are not people who are being smuggled into Canada. These are not people who are coming in so-called illegally. These are people who are in the mainstream government structured program for labor migration. And if this is happening in um, our normal system, uh, you can imagine what is happening in the undocumented system. And I'm doing a lot of work on that right now with um, women in, um, undocument in undocumented sex workers. Um, and it does call into question our entire system of creating these categories of those um, who are permanent, those who are temporary and exploitable. Um, so, after paying your fees, after borrowing money to pay fees, you get on the bridge and you walk across it and the inability to enforce rights is profound. Um, about 20% uh, of migrant workers get paid less than minimum wage. Um, 
uh, about uh, a third of them uh, do overtime work with no overtime pay. A significant proportion of them are by law excluded from the right to overtime pay. Um, the, uh, they're subject to all sorts of other forms of work theft. They're subject to conditions at work which are profound violations of health and safety, not being given um, health and safety training, not being given uh, safety equipment, and when they are injured, being uh, deported, often within 24 or 48 hours if they're farm workers, um, because there is a steady stream of workers who are organized on the other end to replace them. Right? And so people work when they're injured, they work when they're sick, they work when um, they're not being paid in the hope that eventually they will be able to stay, uh, that they will be able to have a security uh, to allow the rest of their family uh, to find safety. Um, but they also stay in profoundly abusive circumstances because if they don't, then the recruiter is going to exact pain from them um, and their families. And uh, whether that is physical um, or uh, uh, theft of their property in their home country or reprisals against their family in their home country. Um, they are getting squeezed from both ends, right? From the recruiter and from the employer to continue working um, in a system in which their rights are not enforceable. Because the right systems depend on them to come forward as individuals to complain. And as I said, we have a system where those who are most vulnerable, are subject to um, forms of labor migration that make them even more vulnerable and even more ex um, exploitable. Um, but we don't let them stay. We extract their labor and then send them home because they are considered not, um, not good enough for, um, for uh, permanent residence. And it's interesting because that kind of language was present in the Canadian immigration system from the very beginning. Um, that there were those who were considered suitable to build uh, the Canadian nation and those who were not. And to the extent that our temporary labour migration programs right now um, are a highly racialized, race-divided program, um, it replicates the kind of race-based immigration laws that we had up until the 60s. Um, it just comes through in a different form, where we can now extract labor, um, but not let people stay. And so the question is, for all of us, how do we build a true solidarity city? How do we build a true um, solidarity province and community, where we respect the rights of those um, who are our neighbors, who are our friends, um, who contribute to making our lives and our communities better? Um, because migrant workers are your friends. You may not know it. There's lots of migrant workers at your university. There's lots of migrant workers in your communities. Um, so how do we push back at the incredibly toxic, venomous, hateful politics of the moment? One of the things that is actually um, good, that is an opportunity, is that immigration and migration are um, top of mind. They are the headline stories. They are the points of policy and dispute uh, right now, which means that we have an opportunity to push back and give our story and say what kind of society we want. Um, we cannot remain silent in the face of the hate that is being normalized. And I think it's particularly important for those of us who do have status, for those of us who do have the privilege of security, um, to stand up and uh, say loudly what kind of society, what kind of vision of society we want. Um, I've, I do a lot of uh, organizing with migrant worker communities. I do a lot of meeting with politicians. And what politicians always tell me um, is that, well, this is very interesting what you're telling me about, about migrant workers and their situation, but I'm not hearing it from my constituents. 
And the reason they're not hearing it from their constituents is because migrant workers can't vote. So what we've done is create a system in which we have a revolving working class, right, that moves around the globe, in and out, with temporary status and no right to vote, which undermines not only the quality of work um, in our society, but also undermines the quality of democracy, and it undermines um, the capacity to have a real working class voice in our political, um, uh, our political system. And so those of us who do have voice need to use it by bringing uh, migrant workers with us when we meet with politicians. Um, say, I'm your constituent, and here are other people who live in your, uh, your riding. You need to hear from them. Uh, we need to find ways to, uh, to not just be bystanders, you know? Uh, to not let those awkward moments pass because they're awkward. Um, the more that we do that, the more we hear hate normalized, the more we hear racism and xenophobia normalized, the more it silences everyone, even if those voices are uh, marginal voices, minority voices. Um, and so it's past time, we can't be bystanders anymore. I've been doing a lot of uh, training on human rights work recently, and um, doing a lot of training on bystander intervention. How do you move from the person who is silenced by the horror that you're seeing to someone who can take action? And um, the answer is, you know, for people who actually study this, um, they call them the five Ds. So direct intervention, when someone is saying something totally toxic, say, ah, no, not in my city, not in my country, right? You're talking about people I care for. These are people who make your community better um, and make it so the things that are said um, are shameful again, make racism shameful again. Uh, so direct intervention. Um, you can distract if you see someone who is being uh, subject to, uh, to abuse. Um, find ways to, uh, to give them an out. Say, um, hey, can I help you? Do you want to come with me? Or stand between the person who's abusing them and give them shelter. So, uh, direct, distract, delegate. Who should be doing something about this? People won't do something about it unless uh, with, if they have power to do something, they won't do something unless they know it's happening. So make sure those people who have power know that you're watching, know that you don't think um, that they're taking the right steps. Um, exercise your democracy every day, um, not just at voting times. Um, if something happens, you don't always know what to do in the moment. And so, if you see something, if you see a trend, if you see a pattern and it troubles you, you may not be able to get something into the media, out to a politician, out to an employer immediately. Um, but you can still do it afterwards, a couple of days later. Say, this is still really bothering me. What are we going to do about this? You can exercise your constitutional rights of collective action and come together uh, to address it, and you can document it. Um, those are the things that, where that research that um, is being done at the IMRC um, and through the networks um, across the country and globally are really important for documenting that. But systems don't change just because we document things. That is an absolutely critical part of the equation. Things change because of the way that we interact with each other every day on a person-to-person -person basis. And so, um, building a system that gets past the polarization, that reminds us that, um, that we're all human, the fact that we put a label of migrant on someone doesn't make them less worthy, less human. So, what we need to do is to do what Carrie did so well, which is to put people's humanity front and center, to put people's suffering 
front and center because that suffering is caused by the choices that we make, active choices to design policies in a particular way to privilege some and to harm others. The harms and the outcomes that you see are not accidental. They are the products of a system that was designed to deliver precisely this. And so if you don't like it, you need to say so and you need to demand change. And maybe at the end of the day, that will let all of us be free. Thank you. Um, for that illuminating talk and inspiring work that you're doing. Um, just to situate you all and where we are in the evening, we'll have just a few minutes for a question and answer session. There are microphones right here uh, behind these few rows on either side of the auditorium. So if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please um, come, come to the microphone and we'll, we'll take some of those in a moment. Um, we will then uh, have a musical performance and then invite you outside into the lobby um, for food and drink and more music and festivities. Um, so I'm going to now join Professor Faraday over here in these lovely club chairs on the stage. Thank you. Again, I really appreciated um, how you contextualized this contemporary system that we have and take for granted and reminded us of its deep, deeply racialized historical roots and policy and migration histories um, here in Canada. So I see that our MPP, Laura May, is prepared um, with our first comment or question. Take it away. To say, um Thank you so much. And in particular, thank you so much for this notion of trying to rehumanize um, these discussions, because I can tell you that it is extremely disheartening that um, it's so quick that we've normalized um, pretty divisive and, uh, in my world, just wholly scary language. Um, I'm actually wondering what I can do to get people to inundate me with emails of actual personal stories. Because one of the things that I am finding um, is powerful at Queen's Park is when I don't speak theoretically about immigration um, or theoretically about why it's a problem to say illegal border crossers, but instead say, you know, I was talking to Joe the other day and Joe said blah, blah, blah. So, that's my question. You know, there's, I want to give you a longer answer to that um, because I think it's, it's really um, an important and complicated thing about, to think about how you get stories. Um, I've worked with migrant workers for nearly 30 years and I have to say that migrant workers are in many ways sick of being um, studied, sick of being asked to perform their victimhood um, when for years and years people come, mine them for their stories of suffering, and then don't do anything. And so the issue of asking people to perform that victimhood publicly again when they are the ones who suffer the risk of it is something that caters to our privilege. Um, and caters to our refusal to believe that the aggregate statistics that we already have, the many, many stories that we already have, are not enough. That we somehow don't know this story, even though we've been telling it for decades. So, um, I understand that people want to hear personal stories. Um, but it comes at a cost for the individuals who come forward because uh, sometimes coming forward means that your family is attacked back home, right? All it takes is one phone call, right? Sometimes it means that uh, you'll go back to the bunkhouse and the recruiter 
and their thugs will come and beat you, right? Will threaten to kill you, will steal your things, will steal your passport, your travel documents, right? It's not easy to come forward. And these things that I'm saying are not exaggerations. They are real. They have happened to people I know and care for. Um, the, uh, but what was interesting is that a few years ago, um, migrant workers who are organizing themselves, right? They have agency, they have deep political analyses about what is happening to them. They have suggestions. They got sick of being, um, you know, of the media coming and saying, oh, give us someone who can tell us a story. And they themselves organized a speaking tour around the province. And migrant workers went across the province and spoke in halls like this to community meetings and saying, we're gonna tell you our stories ourselves without mediation. Um, and that was tremendously powerful. And yet, um, you can come up with dozens of stories every day that will break your heart and yet nothing changes. And so I'm absolutely happy to help you um, and uh, absolutely happy to connect afterwards about how we can do that. But I think it's important for um, all of us to know the cost of it and um, to know we've heard this story, right? And, and we can be better than this. Thank you, Professor, for, uh, Professor Faraday, for your lovely presentation. Uh, in your presentation, I was thinking about how we kind of, uh, every day, in, in our everyday circumstances, how we interact with these powers and inequalities. Uh, and one thing that I recognize, and I'm not sure if you talked about this before, uh, is temporary agencies, uh, where it's not even, you know, foreign uh, uh, workers who are being brought here, but it's also uh, Canadian citizens or permanent residents that are here who don't have yeah. uh, a lot of job opportunities being subjected to horrible circumstances. I know a few months ago, the government of Ontario was talking about legislating some more uh, laws around uh, temp agencies, uh, but, you know, I got that really uh, got me going. Uh, and a lot of these agencies, they're pretty prolific, especially in Toronto. If you look at a lot of the factories, a lot of factory workers, especially in meat packaging and grocery stores, uh, it's a lot of temp agencies and similar dynamics are happening out. So I just wanted to know if you could touch on that really briefly. Oh, I'd be happy to touch on that. The, um, there are thousands of temp agencies. They are flourishing. They are one of the largest uh, growing, quickest growing uh, business models. And they entirely serve a low wage, low rights workplace strategy. For workers who are um, working through temp agencies, most of them are earning 50% of what the full-time direct hires are earning who are doing the exact same jobs as them. They are paid in cash, off the books, no deductions, no access to EI, no, no access to health and safety. Um, the, uh, there was, in, in, and so as part of the three-year process that this province just went through of having um, uh, a broad uh, investigation into the changing workplace, into the rights in the changing workplace, um, where there were consultations over two years right across the country, led by independent um, special advisors, one representing management, one representing workers. Um, they came up with large list of strategies that focused on how recommendations for how to fix that vulnerability that's being created. Um, and one and a number of them were enacted in Bill 148, which you will hear about in the news a lot because it is currently um, under attack and subject to being repealed uh, by the current government. The uh, Bill 148 introduced legislation that uh, would subject temp agencies to much uh, stricter uh, regulation, would make employers uh, much more liable for what is happening um, for their, the workers that are hired through temp agencies, and very significantly would require temp agency workers to be paid the same as direct hires um, to get the same benefits. And that is the legislation that the current government is uh, 
uh, going to uh, repeal. And that is, and it's exactly those protections that are going to be repealed as part of Bill 47. Um, so it is doubling down on a low wage, low right strategy that not only, and you're right, that this is not something that is just about uh, temporary labor migration. Our temporary labor migration programs are not separate from our broader political economy. They are just one facet of a broader uh, legal structure that is increasingly being amended to lower rights. And the more you can drop the floor, the more profit can be extracted. And so on the ground, there is in fact significant solidarity being built between migrant workers and temp agency workers and low wage workers because they are all working side by side in these jobs um, that dehumanize people and treat them as the fuel for employers to burn rather than the engine that drives our businesses. Maybe our last question or comment. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, Prof, I found this presentation very, very interesting um, and very relatable um, because I've had family members who have come to the United States and Canada on these programs. And now I'm here as a temporary um, immigrant, as a, a postdoctoral scholar. So uh, my experience has been a little bit different from theirs, though. Mm -hmm. Now, I find it interesting, this kind of connection, this kind of global South connection that is both positive and perverse in its outcomes. Um, so, you know, on the side of on the receiving country, of course, there are a lot of benefits to these countries. There are also a lot of benefits to the sending countries, of course, in terms of the ways in which, um, you know, the impact that it can have on the families um, with, with this capital coming in. Now, I was really interested in, under, in trying to get an idea or a sense of whether or not, or what the, what the, what the action was, or the, perhaps the global sentiment at least, we could start there, as it relates to these connections, as it relates to what is happening, particularly as it relates to these more latent forms of exploitation. So not necessarily the illegal stuff, the stuff that's explicitly illegal, like you know, the beatings and stuff, but for example, you know, sending somebody home after an injury. You know, so these more latent forms are, um, of exploitation, and I would go as far to say um, ex ex enslavement, to what extent have international agreements between governments addressed these issues? Is it at all inscribed in any international policy? I don't know if you... It's the international agreements um, are not focusing on um, promoting worker rights. They're promoting the flow of, um, of work, right? The flow of workers to continue that circular cycle. But there's a number of things in there um, that I think are interesting when you talk about what are some of the latent or hidden forms of um, exploitation that happen. Um, certainly, so if we take the injured worker who is sent home, what that means is that um, that worker is being denied access to um, uh, the workplace safety insurance rights and payments that they would get here, the rehabilitation, the job retraining, they're just sent home. Um, and that becomes uh, a problem for them to deal with individually and a cost for their home systems. The same with um, uh, the draw on our employment insurance system. Every migrant worker is paying into the EI system. They cannot claim benefits, right? Um, if they are migrant workers who are um, coming to Canada on a cyclical basis, like um, migrant farm workers, as soon as they leave the country, they are not eligible for benefits. Um, if uh, someone leaves a job because of exploitation, they can't draw on EI because they don't have um, a work permit 
that authorizes them to work for another employer, uh, and you have to be eligible to work in order to get EI. We have permits that tie workers to individual employers. Um, but on a larger system, if we look at the broader system that's being created, the temporary labor migration programs don't end, um, they don't provide a sustainable economy in home countries, right? Um, that increasingly what is created is a dependence on continued migration. And um, from the north and from the countries that hire uh, um, workers with temporary status, there's an incentive to keep that imbalance because there is no pool of workers to draw from if there is global equality. Um, and a last sort of example that I would give is, you know, I mentioned the uh, skyrocketing numbers of uh, international students who are coming into Canada. The rise in the numbers of international students has coincided with the withdrawal of provincial funds for, fun uh, for post-secondary education. Um, uh, international students pay full freight, right? They don't, they pay double what, um, uh, domestic students pay, and that has become a funding model for, for post-secondary institutions to be able to bring in as many international students because in an era of austerity, it's how they keep the lights on. But it doesn't actually promise those post-secondary students um, access to permanent status or to security in Canada. And so um, all of these different things are connected um, and they reinforce each other. That, you know, as I said, temporary migration is not separate. It's absolutely foundational to how our economy is structured. Can I ask you to make it a very brief uh, question? And I'll try to give brief answers, Thanks. sorry. Go ahead, please. My question is just uh, a comment. I'm a human rights advocate, and I work at the Grand River Community Health Center in Sincom and Brantford. We provide a medical clinic every Friday to the seasonal cultural workers. So we hear uh, every Friday hundreds of stories about the situation from the migrant workers. But um, also, what is the role of the Canadian government into this situation? Right? Uh, most of the people, they don't want to come to work in here. They said that if they can have a better life down there, they don't have the, yeah. the, the need to come to Canada. But there are the mining companies, Canadian mining companies, yeah. who destroy their lands, forcing them to abandon the countries. What we see now with the Honduran uh, caravan. Uh, these people could have a better life but the Canadian government, with the U U.S. government, they organized a military coup and removed a uh, democratic government. And the Canadian, the current Canadian government is still supporting a corrupt president that came into the power in Honduras by the electoral fraud. Uh, but Canada hasn't said nothing about this situation. Canada is focused on Venezuela and Cuba and other countries that have similar situations. So that's a hypocrisy from the Canadian government. So for um, all that we are here, we have to say thanks to all those people that come to work in here. If they don't come, we don't have nothing in our food yeah. and tables. Thank you. I, I agree with you completely that, um, that there's complicity on both, like, that Canada is actually helping produce that um, precarity that drives people abroad, right? And uh, into that cycle of migration. And um, uh, Pura Velas Velasco, who, was, uh, who came to Canada as a caregiver, wrote um, an excellent piece about 20 years ago about her experience, um, about how a Canadian mining company did exactly that in her community in the Philippines, which is how she ended up um, on the cycle of being a migrant worker coming to Canada when it was Canada that drove her from her home. And often um, in, in Canada, we speak with uh, a narcissism that says, well, people should be happy to come here. We have it good here. They should be happy to be here. Don't they all want to come here? The answer is no. 
People want to stay home. They want to live in their community with their families. And what are we doing to enable that to happen? Um, there is uh, a significant need for international solidarity um, between advocates at that level uh, so that this system of temporariness can end. Um, Unfortunately, Canada is doubling down and its vision for the future depends on increasing temporariness. But it's through these international networks of, of researchers, of workers, of advocates that we can build the solidarity to push back at that and to say, um, we're getting off this merry-go-round. Thank you once again, Professor Faraday, for, um, for your openness to conversation with us, which I hope will continue um, shortly in the lobby. And now we have uh, my colleague, Janet McLaughlin, returning to the stage to introduce our final portion of the program here. And could the pictures magically reappear? Thank you. There you go. Thank you. So I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing our final speaker tonight, Dr. Michael Stevenson. <laughs> Just the name gets that, that kind of a welcome, so you know, you, but, but unfortunately I have a few more things to say about him and I know everyone's waiting for that food, so I will try to be brief, but I, I do need to say a few things. For those of you in the room who don't know who he is, Mike. Dr. Mike, uh, as he's widely known, is founder and director of Sanctuary Refugee Health Center in Kitchener. How many of you have heard of Sanctuary? Just look around at the amount of people who have been touched by Sanctuary in this room. Dr. Mike has dedicated his career to refugee health since he began his residency in 2006. Mike started Sanctuary with just six patients in April of 2013 and has worked tirelessly to grow this clinic to now more than 3,300 patients with dozens of staff and volunteers today. His work has recently been recognized with the Kitchener Mayor's City Builder Award and a Council Award from the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. Now on a personal note, I've known Dr. Mike when he was just Mike. And we were undergraduates at the University of Guelph, proud class of 2002. Sorry if that dates us, Mike. For the entire time I've known him, Mike has maintained a steadfast commitment to social justice and medicine, and he has applied this through his work with refugees, and our community has benefited greatly from his dedication to this traditionally underserved population. Mike grew sanctuary out of nothing but a vision to provide a place of holistic health and healing for the thousands of refugees entering our community. Making this happen was harder than you might expect, and he and other volunteers often work long hours without pay to ensure that refugees in our community can get the care they need and deserve in a welcoming environment and in their own language. Caring for refugees well, it costs a lot of money, and these costs aren't absorbed in our traditional healthcare system. For example, our system doesn't compensate for the extra time needed for working with interpreters, for filling out application forms, for health-related needs, or for the hours of counseling and advice that newcomers often require. But Mike never let these barriers stand in his way, and he absorbed these costs and others on his own to ensure that exceptional care was always provided. And every time I mention uh, Sanctuary or Dr. Mike to anyone who works with refugees, oh yes, they all go to Dr. Everyone loves Dr. Mike, Dr. Mike, Dr. Mike. It's, it's amazing. Um, it truly is exceptional care and everyone I've ever heard of who goes to Sanctuary can attest to that. Now I've sometimes heard the joke among Sanctuary staff that Dr. Mike would sell one of his kidneys if he had to to keep Sanctuary afloat but we're really hoping it doesn't have to come to that. Which is why we are raising money tonight to support Sanctuary's efforts. Now you can do this by making a donation through the Sanctuary volunteers or by participating in our very enticing raffle, which is just outside. And all of these funds will go towards Sanctuary. Now if my endorsement wasn't enough, I want to end on the words of our record columnist, Louisa D'Amato, 
responding to a post from then Minister of Health, Jane Philpott, who tweeted praise to praise Sanctuary's efforts. Louisa remarked, Dr. Mike is the closest thing to a saint we have in our community. Now, Louisa is not quite as powerful as the Pope, but if she is endorsing sainthood, he must be doing something right. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mike. So uh, one of the auction items tonight in, is my kidney. So if anyone wants to bid on that, uh, please go ahead. Wow, I, I, I've never had such a great introduction. Uh, I'm afraid I probably won't be able to, to deliver after that promise. Um, so, so forgive me. Um, we are uh, expanding, which is a, which is a terrific thing. Um, we, uh, we have outgrown the space that we moved to uh, only 18 months ago. I remember um, m many of, of you in the audience are, are staff or volunteers with, the, with Sanctuary. I remember we got to our new space and we, we all said, wow, this is huge, this will last us for years. And it wasn't very long before we realized, no, we need, we need more space. And, and why do we need more space? There's, there's a couple of reasons. Um, the first reason is that we want to deliver the, the kind of care that people need all in one spa spot, all in one space, so that people don't have to um, come to us and then go across the city to, to another care provider and then go to a third place where they may or may not um, have the language skills or they may or may not have an interpreter there. We know that people do better um, when multidisciplinary teams are, are all in one site. Um, and so that's what we try to do. And we've had, uh, we've had the psychologists come to us. Uh, we've had uh, staff from the Multicultural Center, settlement workers come to us. Uh, we have a social worker. We have an Ontario Works caseworker who comes to us. Um, we have people from CCAC, the, the Community Care Access Center, who come to us, and, and many more on site. And we want to continue to expand the services that we provide for refugees in the community so that people can get good quality care that encompasses not only health care and, and doctors like me, but, but determinants of health so that we can see people thrive and succeed in our community the way that they ought to. The, the other reason that we're expanding is that we have almost 3,500 patients. Um, we have people who literally have no place else to go. They can't go elsewhere because there is nowhere else that they can get care, the kind of care that they need. We have about 400 people on our wait list that we would like to take off our wait list. Um, and, and adding the space will allow us to do that, will allow us to serve a larger proportion of the, the newcomer community in KW. Um, so please do consider um, donating to us. Please do consider bidding on the items. Um, and uh, I, I hope that you take the opportunity tonight to meet some of the wonderful staff and volunteers um, and find out more about Sanctuary uh, if, you, if you don't already know. Um, I, I, the other purpose for me being up here um, is to introduce the musical guests. I uh, dutifully, at the end of a long and busy clinic day, I printed off uh, the, the, um, the, the remarks that I had prepared uh, and I left them on my printer. Um, so we'll all come back tomorrow when I'll, when I'll have that. Um, and, oh, here we go, here it is. Okay, um, so during the reception that will follow, uh, you'll be able to hear some terrific entertainment. Uh, performed by some of our young friends, uh, the, some friends of Sanctuary. Um, Manar Naim is the first one. She's an undergraduate student in physics who came to Laurier from Syria in September 2017 as a scholar sponsored through a partnership between Jasur Organization and the Laurier Student Organization International Students Overcoming War, or ISOW. She's an accomplished oud player, as we'll all hear this evening. So, Shukran Manir. Manar, sorry, Manar. Um, Mubarak Mubala Hindi uh, has recently come to live in Waterloo after arriving in Toronto from Uganda in December 2017. He has a passion for music since he was very young, and you'll hear in his music that passion is quite obvious. Uh, he was a leading member of a youth choir that toured in North America on several occasions. Tonight, we can enjoy his singing and guitar playing. And Asante Sana, Mubarak. Patrick Set. Deborah and Mika arrived in Kitchener just over one year ago. They recently uh, celebrated their one-year anniversary in Kitchener. 
Um, their family from South Kivu province in Democratic Republic of Congo uh, had been refugees in neighboring Burundi for more than 15 years. Prior to their resettlement in Canada, they lived in one of the largest refugee camps. It was here that Patrick led a choir of some 40 young people singing Christian songs that encourage hope and express thanksgiving. Uh, today, they are all students at Eastwood Collegiate, uh, where their musical abilities have been readily recognized. And Patrick will introduce the two songs which they will sing in their native Kenya Mulenge language. And Murakoze to Patrick and the Gitako singers. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I feel like I won't be able to explain every, uh, every single word in the songs that we're going to sing right now because of my kind of poor English. <laughs> yeah, but um, the first song that we're going to sing yeah, is that I assume that the mercy and goodness of God will follow me um, till the end of my life. Um, and all of you who, are, um, who have been supporting refugees around the world, we hope that the mercy and goodness of God will follow you, will be, will be uh, with you. And we are going to thank God also for um, protecting all, all of those refugees around the world. I think that we, the world doesn't have enough protection uh, to, give, to offer to those people, but we believe that God is doing that in where, they, where you are not, God is doing that. Where you, you can't protect those people, God is doing that. Amen. <laughs> Kugira neza kwawe Nimbabazi zawe Ziza no maho Ndawi hamyako Kugira neza kwawe Nimbabazi zawe Siza no maho Davi hamnya Davi hamnya Kugira kugira neza kwawe Nimbaba siza we Siza no maho Davi hamnya ko Davi hamnya ko What to What it quit a ho. What to rinde mashure? What to rinde atadu kanye o? To ragushima kuri mana. It quit a ho. Davi ha nyako. What to 
Waturinzugo tugenda Hoye turagushima kurimana Itkita eho Waturinze ugo tugenda Watuzigamye turatandu kanye Turagushima kurimana Itkita eho Tabiham nyako Tabiham nyako Kugira kugira neza Nimbabazi Kwawe Mbaba ziza we Ziza no maho The second song that we are going to sing Thank you so much So the second song that we are going to sing, I, uh, I hear like there is a missing voice. <laughs> Actually, we, we have never uh, played the drum when we, <laughs> we were singing. So um, for the second song, that's why I asked him to join us. Uh, the second song that we are going to sing uh, is saying that, so uh, towards all of you who are trying to, uh, to help people around the world. I think there's like some things that you can't do, but God is uh, with those who try to support others. God is with those who try to, to bring peace in this world because he's the peace, is it the peacemaker? <laughs> yeah, that's the one. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's the one, he's the first peacemaker. If you want, uh, you want to bring peace in the world, Know that God is the master of peacemakers. Amen. Um. Zogera kucho ya vuze, zogera na ya mgiye. Kukwimana tarumunu Gwiweshe, gwiweshe Iyo, iyo ifuze virawa Yatege kawiga komera Nifiti jambo janyuma Kuringe zogeda Zogera kucho ya vuze Zogera na oya mgie Kukwima na tarumunu Ngwiweshe, ngwiweshe Iyo, iyo ifuze virawa Yatege kawiga komera Nifiti jambo ya nyuma Kuringe Nifiti jambo ya nyuma Kuringe, kuringe Nifiti jambo ya nyuma Kuringe That was, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. 
Um, now it is my job to invite you all, to thank you all and to invite you all to eat and drink and participate in this fun raffle that we've set up to raise funds for sanctuary. You'll find many um, exciting prizes outside uh, for which we are very grateful um, to local individuals, artists, businesses who've donated them. You'll see them thanked outside and I will just quickly acknowledge some of them here. Artists Sarah Flanagan of Sarah Eilish Designs, Michaela Quinn, Kat Herndon, and Anna Vergunst. Um, also, Rejuvenate Medical Spa, Famosa Pizzeria, Arabesque, Wordsworth, Wordsworth Books, Amanda Sills Photography, Meadow Acres, House of Bamboo, and Rafaela Golic of Creating Wellness 101 Reflexology Service. So all of these people and more donated wonderful things to which we would like to express our gratitude. Um, thank you all for being here and please enjoy the festivities outside. Thanks so much.